Welcome, welcome to a new episode of Arden Perspective. I'm your host, Alayth, and on this show today, we're going to have a very special guest. She's a very resourceful lady. Um, as a matter of fact, when I typed her name in, into Google, almost the first two or three pages that came up were strictly on her. So, um, so I think we're going to benefit a lot from this interview. The first I'm talking about today is Ms. Sari Samira Mia, right? Perfect. <laughs> Um, so alaikum. thank you for being on the show today. Walaikum assalam. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Um I, how how's how are things um with COVID and what have you, first of all, in, in the UK? Um it's very much home based. Uh we're in lockdown, so going out is minimal and for essential things. Yeah. So luckily I can work from home quite easily, but in the new work from home and in the new kind of existence we have so alhamdulillah yeah. it's all good <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah yeah we thank god i mean i think i think it's brought some some good and some bad obviously just like any other situation right um but yeah we, we thrive we'll thrive inshallah inshallah okay so um let's let's start off um before we even go into art itself and geometric patterns and what have you let's talk about your upbringing okay um where did where were you born and how was your upbringing as a Okay, so I was born in west of London, yeah. and I've got two older brothers. My parents are from Pakistan, so I would be what you describe as a typical uh, British Pakistani. So uh, there's many of us whose parents were um, came over in the 60s, 70s, earlier or later, and then so we were brought up in these Pakistani households, living this kind of double life where at school we're kind of not sure how much of a you know, you know how much of your faith or your uh, culture anyone else knows about because in my school in my area there was very few um, non-white people yeah. and if they were non-white well, they were most likely my friend so my best friend was a West Indian and my other friend was a Hindu from uh, Gujarat I didn't even know what Gujarat was I thought you're just the same as me right but I didn't know the differences okay. between all of these things so and my other best friend was from South Africa, but she was um, Asian South African. So then, okay. you know, it was just, there was very few of us and we all kind of found each other. But it was really, I, you know, given that um, there was very few Asians or non-white people in my area, yeah. because I was quite cute and I was quite sweet, I didn't really get much um, of a difficult time, but my old brothers, oh my gosh, so much racism, be mm. getting beaten up and all of that, mm. they experienced, my father experienced it, but I somehow seemed to have slipped through, <laughs> not mm. too um, painfully. So yeah, I, I enjoyed that. And then I, my school being, you know, few Asians, Muslims, yeah. but then my high school was so diverse. It was amazing. I had so many different nationalities in my uh, school. It was a girls' school. Uh, called okay. Ellen Wilkinson and a lot of people from our I don't know any, a lot of Muslims ended up yeah. going there you know so yeah I just had such a good time and, and, and being friends with so many different people and like when I look at what they're doing and what they're up to now really you know accomplished people so mashallah okay. it was a good environment I enjoyed school I enjoyed uh, primary school and high school and then so on. should I carry on <laughs> no, no no that's nice um I think you know I think a lot of people a lot of people know you, but might not know your background. So I think this no, is actually, yeah. So I think that, that that would be interesting for them to know um, your thousand or so students out there. Um, uh, so you, you, um, where did you go to college? Where did you go to college? I went to, I went to college in London as well. So I went okay. to King's College and okay. I did a maths and management degree. Okay. Um, and it's like my commute got longer and longer. So my school was a bit further. My college, as in uh, 16 to 18, was a bit further in Hammersmith. Yeah. And then my university was a bit further um, into London. Okay. So, And then eventually when I got my proper first job, not my temping annoying ones, that was in Canary Wharf. So I was kind of making my way across London and getting further and further uh, towards the centre and then eventually to the east. But yeah, um, I studied maths and management. So um, mm. the art does not play a feature in uh, my education in mm. a big way. I did do an art A level. Okay. for um 16 to 18 as a as a thing but um it was mostly ceramics which is a bit odd i know but yeah so i have an a level in ceramics <laughs> oh gosh oh, well. oh well, I, I, well it, it all ties in right art is art i think at the end of the day so it, it doesn't matter if it's ceramics or if it's um painting or drawing or what have you it, it all kind of comes around and i think one of your teachers actually mr adam williamson 
who I've spoken to, um, is kind of is a very good example of that because he does yeah. everything. <laughs> he's done everything. Yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, um, he's had some magic though. Like have you seen, when you see him in action, yeah. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, if you've got a piece of work and a piece of artwork and little bits are a bit rubbish, then you know Adam might come and carve a corner and you're like, oh wow. We might draw a bit and you're like, oh wow. <laughs> so, very talented, mashallah. Yeah, yeah, mashallah. Uh, so. Okay, so you you end up getting a math a math and management degree. Um, yes. were you, were you looking to become a teacher at, um, while you were studying no. or no? No. <laughs> so basically I had, uh, two things I was interested in. Uh, okay. firstly, I wanted to go into investment banking okay. or I wanted to go into, uh, marketing. Okay. And so when I was, gra when I graduated, I applied for both, um, just kind of keeping it open and kind of tweaking my, cv and applications accordingly yeah. and i did get some marketing interviews but i didn't get the jobs and then i got a job in banking and it was a real um not like amazing job it was um at barclays bank yeah. and i just started off doing quite uh, basic tasks admin tasks but somehow i do my there was somebody called the fraud officer and yeah. he noticed my work and then all of a sudden i became fraud as officer's assistant and so <laughs> me and jeff used to like uh, deal with fraud cases okay. um that used to happen to Barclays customers and it was yeah. really really interesting but it was something like a nine month contract and yeah. because it wasn't a graduate job and because they didn't really recognize my education I was like well I don't need to be here beyond nine months and the like I think the lady said I was one of the first people to leave a nine month contract and not renew it. and I was like really mm. so I'm really in the wrong place that if we're such a mismatch yeah. and then that led to more that experience led to really horrible um temping jobs in banking environments like in the city of london yeah whereby you know the, if you're a temp you're treated like the lowest of the low people don't even look at you or talk to you so yeah. i was one of those and i was doing really rubbish sort of tasks like data entry literally typing numbers pressing enter Ooh, okay. all day long so it was really basic but then that led to another job and that led to the job that I stayed in the longest, which is um, a securities administrator. Okay. So I worked for a company which is now called the Deutsche Bourse. Yeah. So it was, um, they're, a, they're a, I've got forgotten the whole lingo of it, but basically they're, I want to say a trading platform for people to buy and sell securities. Okay. Um, but yeah, so therefore I was in the department called New Issues and I enabled people to issue their bonds and securities onto the market that we were part of and we held and then they could trade them so it was a uh, it's really good i really enjoyed it but it was tiring it was such long days such hard like long stressful but enjoyable as well so how how, how did that lead to teaching math at uh, secondary school so well you know when you come when you graduate you want to be like this that and the other and the thing that really appeals sometimes is you just want to earn money because you just haven't you know like um, you know my parents are working class you know my dad was a is re retired train driver so mm -hmm. you have a certain level of lifestyle but you know that you know well i've got educated now so i won't earn money so i thought i've got a math degree i can earn money in investment banking so I wanted to earn money. So I kind of went straight for the kind of the jugular um, city. But yeah. then you realize, wait, 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 there's more to life than buying these things that I thought I wanted. Um, yeah. There's more to life than going on these holidays that I thought I you know, should go on. Yeah. You know, this lifestyle that you perceive that is something that everyone seems to want and then you should want as well. When you experience it, you're like, do I want all of the aspects of it? So one of the things I used to uh, question a lot was, um, like why am I working so hard for other rich people mm. you know like it was literally other people's money that was moving around yes. I was like I am really like diligently going for it and I'm like what why and I couldn't see my value beyond serving these rich people so I just thought maybe I should um consider a career where I can have a better impact on people's lives so I considered teaching and I thought about it. I gave my uh, friend a call. I said, do you think I could become a teacher? <laughs> and she encouraged me. And then so I thought about it, I thought about it. And then I went to my old school. I sat there with my head of a year on one side and my history teacher on the other. And I said, I, I think I should become a teacher. They're like, don't do it. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> They're like, it's not a good job. I said, I'm coming for a really hard job. I think I can handle this job. Um, so yeah I got like a mixed messages and but in the end you know I went for it and I'm so glad I did I I enjoyed it 
And well, the funniest thing is one of my colleagues who I'm still in touch with like 20 years later, she was like, Sue, you're going to be a teacher. You were like, how are you gonna? How are you gonna um, tell people off? Like, because you know, I have a certain manner and a way, and I was like, I'm going to do this. So yeah, I was very determined to be a good teacher. <laughs> so you became a teacher at your former school? No, no, no. So uh, I went to my former school okay. as a way of to see the the setup and talk to okay. people I knew, and then I went and trained to become a teacher. And one of the placements um, I was training in. Uh, was the one that I ended up working in so okay. for like 12 years okay okay wow and uh, you must and have been... go ahead go ahead <laughs> there's such a connection there as well the, the old head teacher the head teacher that gave me my job his wife taught in my primary school oh, okay. she taught me knitting and oh, okay. <laughs> his children were in the year below so my interview somehow took on this informal like yeah when you go into teaching, your work experience allows you to jump in at a slightly higher point on the ladder. So, yeah. you know, say there's grades one to 10. My experience means I could have gone in at a two or a three or a four. So I was like, I should be a four. You know, I worked in banking. So I kind of in my chit chat promoted myself just because, you know, like I was f so comfortable with this chap. And like, he, well, I don't think he gave me an easy time, but somehow I, you know. I kind of worked it somehow, <laughs> but it's good. So what you, um, you're teaching secondary school, you're teaching the same grade, um, boys and girls, or what were, you, what were you doing? So, yeah, I teach, I specialize in maths. So therefore, when you teach math, you teach usually aged 11 to 18. Okay. So you teach the very young ones to A level. And okay. um, it was a boys, sorry, it was a mixed school. It was Church okay. of England. Okay. Me. So it was predominantly, um, I'd say it's predominantly white. In, yeah. in terms of diversity, I'd say 25 to 30 to 40 percent, no, 40 percent, 25 percent were ethnically Black, Caribbean or African. Very few Asians. I didn't wear a headscarf then. So uh, very few people like me. But it was a really good environment because, you know, um, it was a, a God centric society because yeah. they were Christian. So, you know, when I went into other schools and I realized, well, they don't really talk about, think about, or live and breathe faith. It was really like, oh, this is a bit boring. But that school that I went to, Church of England, although it was a Christian environment, it was really a comfortable environment. Like the the um, Reverend Hillel, the guy who was the, um, I want to say, I've forgotten the word, the priest there. That's not the word either. There's another word I'm looking for. He was so, um, like accommodating and I said I need to pray where should I pray and then he'd sort things out for me and uh, okay. when we talk about things we had a great conversation on my first I think date about Israel and Palestine yeah. and he had such a nice sort of balanced view of it and I was like oh, I feel so comfortable here so I really enjoyed my time there okay wow well, good so <laughs> uh, um despite you enjoying your your 12 year stay at the same school yeah yeah at, yeah at the same school uh, what made you decide to up and change things okay so basically um there was a lot of curriculum changes and um okay. the, the nature of teaching is you have a big chunk of your job that is literally teaching um then you have a whole bunch of aspects which is the planning the marking and then you have yes. a whole bunch of bureaucracy and yes. i don't like that stuff and i'd mm. already been working on making the syllabus um, or yeah the syllabus for our school and putting in resources and doing a really good job I was really pleased with it and then the curriculum changes meant I would have had to do it all again and in a shorter time span I was like I don't want to do that I really like I don't have ambitions to take on more responsibilities and work my way up the school hierarchy I don't know it didn't really appeal to me okay. so I didn't really see the benefit of it so my little wise plan was to take a year out and somehow hope that it gets sorted <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in a better place honestly genuinely it was like a work shy um element to it I was like I'm not doing it I'm the you know like why would do I always have to do it so there was that element plus I was quite exhausted like I'd been a bit ill uh, you know um, a couple of years before so I went to part-time and then I thought well that's not really just full-time so I went back to full-time so there was sort of like something physically mm. that I was just like you need a break so all okay. of those elements okay were me towards taking a break a year out yeah. 
Okay. So a sabbatical, which, yeah. you know, I said to my head of department, you know, save this class for me because I'll be back in a year. The year nines, I want to have them in year 11. And um, this I've got as a box for this. You know, I really sorted myself out as though I was um, coming back. And my leaving speech was just like, don't worry, I'll be back. You know, like, <laughs> take, chill out, relax. It was it was very, I was very informal about it, but it was literally my, I should have known it was my leaving speech. <laughs> Okay. okay so so what made you decide that you know i need to go to morocco i need to go study arabic i'll see what, what was it? yeah it was very indirect so this is the thing. so i left teaching in the summer of uh 2014 yeah 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 and previously um i'd started with art of islamic pattern the sept September, I guess, before in mm -hmm. 2013. Yeah. And I, you know, you have this hobby, but you have no time for this hobby. And it was really annoying and so on. So I thought if I'm going to take my year out, um, I want to do something valuable. Yeah. But the things I was applying for, so I applied for um, a placement with the VSO, the Voluntary Services Organization. Mm -hmm. And randomly, it was turning out to be Nepal that I would go to. Yeah. But they couldn't match me up with a job. So somehow, you know, all, all parties involved were making the effort, but nothing was working out. Okay. So it turned, I think it somehow turned into, you will try in January or something like that. Something got postponed. So all of a sudden I had this um, four or five months in front of me to do whatever I wanted. So I was like, let's be productive. So I went on a road trip around Europe by myself. Um, I've always wanted to drive around Europe. So I did that. And then when I told friends, they kind of joined me in certain legs of it. I, um, I involved in it the art of Islamic pattern in Granada. Um, okay. I went to a place called Rosales, um, where there was supposed to be a course, but then it got cancelled. But because I turned up in my car and I had nowhere else to go, I just stayed there for the week, just me. And um, while I was there, like I've never experienced living in a Muslim land. Like I've never experienced this idea that you hear the Avan and then you go and pray. I've never experienced yeah. it. And all of a sudden in this mini place that I was staying, that was me praying five times a day. And they're very, they're so accommodating. Like when I think about it, the only females there were the cook who, who could only speak Arabic and I couldn't speak Spanish or, you know, and I only speak English. So there was a, you know, there's a lack of communication, but there was a lecturer there and he spoke English. So I had really good talks with him. And then I was really looking forward to the khutbah on Friday <laughs> I don't know why I thought it'd be really enjoyable. I didn't understand a word of it. So I was really upset because it was all in Arabic and Spanish. Mm. And, you know, I'd spent the whole week having lunch, dinner and breakfast with these people. And they always said, come sit with us, you know, with hand gestures and sort of broken language. And um, but I was so upset. And then this lecturer said, why don't you just learn Arabic? I said, no, I'm not. You know, I'm not really into languages. You know, I, yeah. I do maths. I do art. I don't do languages. He goes, yeah, yeah, you should try it. I said, OK. And I was really upset. So I was crying my eyes out. <laughs> and he was like, why don't you go to Morocco? And I thought, oh, Richard mentioned Fez. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at that time, there were so many like so many conflicts going around the, on around the world so many yeah. countries that previously were places people went like Yemen Yemen and Syria yeah. were out of bounds so I said Morocco okay so I researched it and I found a school and I think it's the school that the lecturer at Rizales mentioned Richard had mentioned Fez is a beautiful place I thought okay so I can maybe finally get a chance to do more drawing and painting so it all kind of happened um, with a series of conversations and events that honest to goodness I had no plan for and then come to January that's when I thought yep yeah, I'm gonna go to uh, Morocco for six weeks and I'm gonna learn Arabic <laughs> and as soon as you start learning a language you're like oh six weeks <laughs> what were you thinking you <laughs> the life <laughs> exactly. so then I stayed for the whole year okay. um but I went home for the summer but okay. I basically tried to stay for the whole year Wow, wow, wow. That's, I'm exhausted at my own life. <laughs> no, no, that's actually very interesting. You know what? Um, when when thing when your destiny is is set in a certain way, it, it just mm. happens. You know, yeah. um, you you didn't plan to meet this guy. You know, in no. Spain and get the uh, the course being canceled first of all, and then you yeah. you met this guy and the 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 lecturer or the imam and and he telling you about Morocco and that tying into what mr adam Wilson said before and you and <laughs> yeah so it, it, yeah it, it's it's definitely interesting though definitely interesting though so but but let's want and let's rewind back a little bit to to your sure, time sure. with um with um adam williamson 
and Richard Henry. I think you got you were studying with them, Art of Islamic Family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so go ahead. I don't even know how I enrolled on that course. And I'm the kind of person who wants to know. So I looked up my Google history okay. <laughs> to find out what did you search? What did I look for that I all of a sudden, you know, found them? And I honestly, I don't know. I don't think I had an interest in patterns. I can't remember knowing that they were even described in this way. But I remember seeing something else similar to it and thinking, mm, that's not for me. But all of a sudden, the theirs was for me. And it was really... I don't know it's beyond again beyond my understanding how I found them and then when I went there I loved it and I made like lifelong friends in that classroom like it was such a fun and I'm the kind of person who says I don't need new friends I've got all the friends I need you know like I said such funny mm. things and then later on I was like you literally made new friends <laughs> and they're really good friends so you know um it was very funny to me how I had this cockiness about certain things and I didn't have a clue so yeah I I turned up to the course and then in the course there was a certain shyness uh, when it came to the end of the 10 weeks we we're like are you enrolling again are you so all four of us that we made a little French group we enrolled again and you know we exchanged numbers we were like turning into schoolgirls, I think somehow but we exchanged numbers and became friends and we enrolled on another course and then we finally enrolled on another course so it was, yeah it was really good it was lovely wow. What, what I mean, besides the friends that you made, what captivated you? Well, I think course? that there's something about Adam and Richard is real that's really magnetic and inspiring. So I remember like first, you know, listening to them and they were sort of like these gems of knowledge just pouring out and so eloquently mm. and so passionately. Mm. And I, I think, you know, like it's so funny, you know, at the time I didn't take notes. I can barely remember the details of certain things, but I just remember that feeling of being so inspired and motivated mm. and just, you know, I, I can like still remember certain things. Like the first time I held a brush um, and I just paused like I'd frozen in time and Adam's like, go on then. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, little moments like that. And you, or like Richard, you know, he would go off and say like a long, um, uh, you know, like a little bit of a monologue, I guess, on a topic. Okay. And I'm like, I am determined to understand every word he says, because they were, you know, like his background's different to mine. I don't understand all the language and all the words. And yes. again, I'd get lost in one or two sentences because I was like, that's amazing. And then I'd lose track and not hear the rest of it. So I had this mini mission to always understand every word, but I never like understood it. But I think that power of um, a good teacher is that gift they give you beyond the classroom. And the one yeah. of them is, in, like, I think, inspiration really. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I've spoken to both of them actually. Um, Richard, yeah, both of them are very different, but um, but I like the way they, the passion that they bring to, to yeah. art is, um, is yeah. definitely something that, um, that's inspirational, definitely. Um, so you eventually go through a couple of courses with, with these guys, uh, with these, um, great artists, not, not, I mean, I'll call them guys, right? Um, you said, you mentioned something in your bio about not picking up a brush until, until, like, until for a while, you didn't pick it up for a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what stopped you? Well, first of all, I didn't own any like painting, okay. um, things and when I wanted to be creative I used to do typography so I used yeah. to use felt tip pens and I think a little fancy gift I got maybe a couple of years earlier was those really nice Fab Faber Castell um pit brush pens yeah. so it was always pen work because I just I don't know I just thought you had to have such a um like a, a collection of resources to paint I just didn't think it was a excuse me a straightforward thing so I never like tried or wanted to paint Okay. So in the session, because all the paints and things were there, you know, I thought, okay, I'm going to paint. Everyone else paints. I'm going to paint. And then that's the first time I painted. And I found actually my GCSE uh, coursework folder and the final piece was a painting. So I thought, oh, you forgot about that. So the last time I probably painted properly was um, age 16 and then then much, much later <laughs> when I did this. So it was a big gap. And um, it was a uh, there's something very special about a paintbrush. Because, you know, like with a pen, you know, there's a different flow. And I think it has its own beauty working in pen. But with a paintbrush, you know, the fact that you can just press it a little bit 
uh, you can change a little bit that flow and that experience of painting and that control you have or that control you want especially is really beautiful I think there's something special about a paintbrush it's um, amazing <laughs> I really like I get hypnotized by painting no oh, we can tell um, all the artwork <laughs> behind you over there um so so after these lessons you eventually like you said you eventually took some trips around europe and ended up in spain what have you and then you decided to go to morocco um what what did you do in morocco in particular besides i mean you said you learn you learn arabic but um yeah. what, what was what was your time comprised of there so i was um i enrolled in a beginner's class of arabic and um, it was in this uh, school called Alif, and it was an American school for the Moroccans to learn English or American English and for university students to take their year out and learn Arabic and then random people like me coming into the sort of a melting pot as well. So um, I signed up. So there was like four hours of um, lessons every day. Okay two hours in the morning two hours in the afternoon and then homework and then you know like um at first I stayed in a hotel and then I stayed in an apartment for some reason I just found a really big apartment and I didn't want to stay with anybody else because I just didn't know like I didn't know I, whether I'd enjoy it or not and I just wanted my own space because I was a mature student and they were all students so I thought they'd probably want a party and there's me just being in the way so let me just have my own place so I got my own place and there was enough space for me to have like a place where I painted a place where I did my Arabic homework a place where I slept and I didn't sleep in the bedroom I just slept in the lounge like it was such a big apartment ridiculous um, and I just have areas and then I just yeah. kept inviting everybody over like do you want food? I've got food. Or like, do you want to paint? I, let's paint together. Or like, do that's, you do Arabic? I went to it in my house. <laughs> that's you that I was saying earlier that you wanted to be by yourself. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, basically, I just didn't, I didn't, I couldn't visualize living with other people that were not my family. I just didn't have that okay. reference. I just okay. didn't understand how it would work. So I'd rather get my own place and then control the, okay, the, the in and out. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's really, I think my own brain overworked it. I should have just lived with other my friends. They were lovely and they didn't party all night. You know, there's no such concept. <laughs> they were just really nice uh, people. So I don't know, yeah. my own problem. <laughs> uh, so you were learning Arabic four hours a day. You're spending some of your time painting. Um, how yeah. did that lead to actually take you doing some courses or teaching some courses over there in Morocco? Yeah, so this is yet another random thing. So you would have thought my background being a teacher and me learning a new skill would have been naturally, my thought would have been, you should teach this. No, 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 no. So I didn't even think of it. And, you know, I was in the school for six or so months, basically till summer. And uh, my family had visited turn by turn, like, and, you know, I had friends come and visit. Um, and then I was speaking to somebody called Zainab. Um, she does Beit al Gandil workshops in um, Abu Dhabi. Oh, that's near you. <laughs> yes. And um, she said, you should teach this stuff, Samira. And I was like, oh, me. And honestly, it felt like such a random thing. And I was like, I should. And honestly, she says I overcredit her with this. But I know before and after that conversation, what my brain space was. And after that conversation, I kind of approached the um, head of the school, David yeah. Amster, who also knew like Richard and Adam as it okay. is. And wow. um, I kind of went into harass mode. Like I'm not, like, I don't think I, I fully realized I had it in me, but I was uh, like, um, I'd email him and then I'd like, oh, excuse me, David, when I saw him, have you seen my email? Uh, I'd like to teach you. Like, I'd really, the man's busy. And I was really, um, I felt like I was harassing him because I wasn't getting any, like an answer. And then he was like, yep, yep, you can teach, just advertise here, do this, we'll pay you this. And I was like, you pay me? You pay. Amazing. <laughs> like, I thought it'd just be for fun. Um, so yeah. I kind of got a, I don't know, it was a token gesture, but they paid for all the resources and they paid me a decent little sum for each session. And I put this sign up sheet um, in the kind of common area space in the garden of the school and people signed up and I was like wow this is so exciting so I was literally buzzing from the teaching and I was like oh god I missed it I miss teaching so much like I miss that energy and that excitement that people have when they're learning a new skill and yeah. you know helping them through when it's difficult and trying to break down complicated things into simple steps oh it's my I was in heaven so I was like wow you know I've only been away from it maybe um Oh, I'd resigned by this point. So it was a year, a year and a bit. So amazing. Wow. It was very good. 
No, oh, so you are you eventually get all these jobs. Uh, well, not not all these jobs, but you earn all these students in um <laughs> in Morocco, right? Yeah. Um, then you made your way back to London. Yes. Right. Um, how did you set up shop there in London? So as I was starting to teach and starting to enjoy it, I thought, oh, there's something in this. I could do this. I can do this. And I'm very, I don't know, like somehow I feel like I was charged with energy to do this. And I was like, OK, I'm going to do it. So I I came home in December and um, I gave myself like that little holiday and then the first things I started to do in January, I love starting things in January. Um, I made my website, like I literally made it in seven hours. <laughs> I thought, you know, people faff around. And I said, at least I've got a skeleton of a website, just do it. I contacted places where I thought I could teach. Um, and I, I often re sort of recite this statistic. So I've contacted or emailed 20 plus people. And I think only three or two replied. Okay. And I was still working with them prior to COVID. So, you know, you have to really reach out and really go for it. And if people mm. ignore you, so be it. You know, I ignore people who randomly contact me sometimes. Just You just don't get around to it. So, you yeah. know, this idea that you've got to hustle, you've got to, you know, push your own kind of um, agenda. That sounds wrong. But, you know, push yourself <laughs> to reach out yeah. to people and make contacts. And, you know, I, I then would t I turned up with my portfolio to... Um, um, the place that I worked at called Open Ealing so it's like a community um arts center yeah. and um the lady there Mandy she's still like I don't work with her right now because of Covid but literally I was till the end it was one of my last workshops she was like wife this is a great portfolio but I took it so seriously that you know I'm going to show you what I'm going to teach this is how I'm going to do it this is what I plan da -da 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 -da. Mm. and I've got this much experience and she was like yep yeah, okay I was like great so I was really pleased that I managed to get that little gig and it you know I recently had a zoom with a um online class with one of the students that was my one of my first students and I just yeah. thought it's so nice to have that memory of the people who like uh, started with you and kind of thought, what is this you know and they kind of just yeah I don't know it was amazing <laughs> wow, wow. That, that that actually that's a very good point to make that not only, well, not only in Morocco, but also when you came back home, you actually, you actually, not. I don't, I don't want to say you forced yourself to, upon people, but you, you made sure that people listened at some point yeah. to get to get things done. Um, you know, yeah. a lot of a lot of people in the beginning, you know, the, uh, a lot of artists, they 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 think, you know, how how am I going to do it? How am I going to get the people don't know me? Why should they take me seriously? But I think what what part of what made you successful was not only being a go getter, but also having a plan you know you said you planned everything you didn't just go there and say well here i am <laughs> it was going to take you seriously but you had you had you had a plan uh, this is how i'm going to yeah, do yeah, it this is what we're going to do etc 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 uh i think that's very important uh, one of my students said to me like samira no one can ever say you're underprepared and i was like that is true <laughs> everything has to be like for me if you're not prepared and not like willing to put in the like uh, below the surface work and yeah. then you're just expecting the result you're like well how why you know like sure. there is an element of luck in everything we do but you you give yourself such a head start by working out so many aspects of it and being doing it to the best of your ability before it's even I guess touched on you know another person or you know reached another person yeah. you know you just give it such a good starting point yeah yeah that's uh, that's very that's very good um let's let's talk about your website because you mentioned your website before you said it was a skeleton <laughs> right but yeah. now it's definitely not a skeleton it's very <laughs> we very well fleshed <laughs> fleshed body if you will um yeah. tell us about in particularly like the resources and things that you have there tell us why you do that what's the benefit that comes from that so you know the thing is with social media it's basically a live research project so the conversations you have with people is basically them telling you uh, or showing you what the world wants in your little niche corner of okay. the world. So um, and so if you get asked, oh, what compass do you use? Um, or what paper do you use? You're like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> and then, you know, you save an answer. 
okay. and then you copy and paste that answer okay. and you're like this is so tedious then you know like how can i like not have to answer the same question 64 million times i mean it's not that many but you know over a period of time it feels like that yeah. so therefore i always thought well, you have to have a website so you can direct people to the website if you want to run anything you have to have a website where you can book things okay. and i always you know in, in my mind the logistics of things um i guess in each time and era it changes but i think the thing that is continuous is if you have a website where you can direct people to it for whatever purpose and reason that is your an extension of your you and your business in a in a kind of very serious proper way so um yeah that that became important and the way it got fleshed out was because of this this idea that you know um people would say i want resources um or like know what to buy so then you know i i use that to do that one of my first pages on the website was um to sell my artwork okay excuse me but i didn't really you know people weren't really buying it so i kind of okay. i thought i shut it down <laughs> and then randomly i got a sale I thought, what <laughs> somebody had bought an artwork okay. so you know there's something for just doing something and letting it be and then if somebody responds fine so yeah i i have a gallery and i have all the things that you expect an artist to have yeah. but you know the books the 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 list of equipment and um, more recently kids resources these are all things that were started off quite basic and then I fleshed them out and made a real determined effort to get them to a certain level of completion yeah. um, so I can leave them be. So I do like this idea that you produce something basic and then when you're ready for it to be kind of fleshed out and really made into something serious, you do that wholeheartedly. Then you can leave it be and then you can just tweak it. So the whole website has had this approach that it's been mm. basic. Some areas were kind of fleshed out and worked on more so than others. Um, I've evolved the front page a million times. You know, you just find a way to kind of build upon what you have. Yeah, that's actually, that's a very good way to approach it. Because, I mean, I, I'm not doing any art that I promote on my page, but mm. a lot of people ask the same questions over and over mm. again. Um, how, how, does he, how does he do this? Uh, where, where can I get this? Uh, how do I start? All right. So I have a lot of these answers. I've never thought of actually doing that. I might actually do that on my website but um i i, yeah, I try yeah, to yeah. answer i try to answer as much as i can but it, it obviously sometimes you you can miss you can miss some um questions here and there or yeah. just get tired <laughs> it's tiring like i think you've got a similar sized account to me yeah. and it's not that it's like oh my god constant rush of questions but you know if you've been busy working and you're doing this you want to you know it's nice to engage with people i would say most people 99 percent of the people i talk to are nice and if they're not nice i'm like you know, perhaps you could say a please or a thank you. That would help. You know, I'd tell them off if they're not nice. Yeah. So, you know, mostly it's nice people who yeah. Um, yeah. just, you know, want a hand and the help. And I, I mean, I'm sure I've skipped and missed loads because it's sometimes hard to keep up. Yeah. But having a website and just having a saved answer saying, go to this website, read it, enjoy. <laughs> it's really helpful. <laughs> Saves my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that's very good advice for, for beginners <laughs> as well. I think um, just start when you start, you start with the basics, right? And yeah, then build yeah. with time, build yeah. with time. Um, so uh, like I said before, when I started this interview with the intro, I said that once I typed your name in and I wasn't exaggerating, I typed your name in Google, <laughs> almost the first three or four pages was, ex was, res was some kind of information about you. Whether it was oh a gallery, whether it was Udemy, whether it was your website, obviously, um, <laughs> social media, etc. I, this is I was the first time I actually researched anybody, um, yeah. and it was strictly that person. So I, I want I want to know I want to know. You know. I mean, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I mean, um, it's not yeah. like you're like this big celebrity that you would expect. <laughs> In that sense, like you weren't, you're not Brad Pitt or something. I would expect <laughs> like the first ten pages to be strictly you, but you've made it somehow. You've gotten your name out there, right? <laughs> so I want you to give us give some practical advice to uh, to a beginning our artist about getting some exposure. So firstly, I don't like I don't fully recognize or know that that exists. No. I I had to early on Google myself a lot because once upon a time my address used to come up. Okay. And it was like, how and why is my address there for everyone mm. to see? So, you know, that was something I kept track on, but I never necessarily um, knew that it was just all my stuff. So I think, you know, like, um, 
I don't know if I do anything deliberately. So yeah, my website is definitely something I worked on and made um, as good, best as I can. Um, I work mostly on Instagram mm -hmm. um, in terms of selling things or like, no, just, you know, content and YouTube. I guess these three are very, they're different worlds because yeah. YouTube and Instagram aren't necessarily the most compatible and they are different. Facebook to an extent, but I find Facebook really um, glitchy on my phone. So when I load a page, it just doesn't load. If I go to my inbox, it just doesn't load. So I basically have been technologically extracted from Facebook because of my phone. So therefore, it's just simple. I just don't get around to doing it because it's just annoying. But I don't know what I've done that I've done it. So, OK, what I think I can do is, you know, like Wix is my website um, host, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of has these things on it called SEO optimization. Okay. Right. So therefore, you just literally go through the steps whatever it tells you to do you do and it kind of says you've got 10 things you should try and fix and put your name here put your location here and okay. you know so on so I did those because you know it kind of tells you to do it but I don't know how and why deliberately like I haven't deliberately done anything that I thought yeah I want to be in Google I don't know I don't know this is magical <laughs> there's a revelation to me <laughs> Okay, so okay, let well let's talk about let's talk about obviously you're you've said you you're on Instagram, you're on YouTube, um, you've tried your hand at Facebook. Um, I'm sure you use I mean you might be using Twitter as well. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Twitter's a good one. Okay. So actually, you know, Twitter's yet another one. So I would say because the platforms I'm sort of using are four different organizations, aren't they? So yeah. therefore I guess that combines in terms of the um the impact it has. So um, so, for example, on Twitter, the world that I've discovered has been amazing. So I am, you know, in my heart of hearts, I'm a math teacher. And yeah. that's where I found math teacher type people. And okay. that's where I've ended up, um, like I wrote something for called the ATM, which is the Association of Teachers of Maths. Um, I'll be doing something in their conference. I would have never done this as a math teacher. And yet I'm in that world. I've, you know, I've done things for the Royal Institution, um, which is such an old, old um, um, was organization in the UK yeah. uh, to do with science. And they do these masterclasses and I've done one. And it's because of connections on Twitter. So Twitter's mm. really powerful for connecting with actual real people who work in your field. Um, yeah. You don't even get to have any Twitter beefs with anybody because it's just not that <laughs> that's not that corner of your Twitter. So it's the maths Twitter and it's amazing. So a lot of my most, I think, valued jobs, which aren't necessarily things that other people value, but are to do with teaching and to do with um, communicating with teachers is has been done on Twitter. So that's a really powerful one. But it's a bit specialist, I guess, but really good. Mm -hmm. and, well, uh, and you to me. Have you been using Udemy for a while or when did that come up? So this is a good one as well in terms of random conversations that have come my way. So when I first did my workshops, um, as in real life people in my workshops, it was Harrow. Um, it was an art center. It was Cass yeah. Art, which is an art shop. And while I was doing them, I was advertising them on my Instagram. And by that time, I'd had a decent following on Instagram and Facebook. Actually, it was somebody. It was a chap in Bosnia who yeah. I can't find because I try to backtrack and, you know, go back to these conversations and figure out how they happen. But he said to me, you're teaching all these workshops. And he was quite, what's the word? Not, he was quite straight. I won't say aggressive, but it wasn't aggressive. But he's like, you're teaching all these workshops. What about us online? I was like, what about you online? So I was like, <laughs> back. And he goes, well, we want to learn too. I said, well, how, how do I teach you? You're like, I was like, go on, if you're going to be, you know, a, like, I'll see with me I want to be back and he said why don't you use an online platform I said such as you know like everything was really like <laughs> sharp and aggressive and he said Udemy I said what's that so I didn't know but he told me try it go and see and like the conversation was something like that and then I did and the way Udemy was set up in 2016 is if you wanted to make a, a course you had to record a 10 minute video okay the audio the video, the quality had to be a certain standard. And if you weren't hitting certain standards, it would tell you what video to, it would give you a guiding video to teach you how to do it. Yeah. So then I one by one fixed my audio, fixed my thing. And I did it all on my phone and I kind of can demonstrate. So my phone was resting on a ruler like this, mm. facing camera down and it was very basic, very, very basic. But basically I learned 
via Udemy's guidance how yeah. to make a course. And I made my two and a half hour course. Mm. Um, I think I made it in a month or two months. But because I've designed curriculums and like courses before for school, it wasn't difficult. The technical side was new. But again, I was, you know, I'm happy to learn. And so I did it. And then I said to him, you can have the course for free. <laughs> so I, I don't know if he took it or not. I can't remember. But I've, I feel like I should find the conversation. But I think he yeah. left Facebook because <clears throat> I can't find his conversation that I had mm. with him. But, I, you know, I'm very grateful to this random chap who told me I should teach online. And then I think I've nearly got 3,000 students. I was like, wow. Very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you're meeting all these random people that are guiding you along the <laughs> along the way. In, this is the thing, you know, like Subhanallah. This is where if I if anyone doesn't have faith, the way my path has happened, I cannot credit any hour to get to the point that I'm going to say, you know, Alhamdulillah. But to be honest, why do people come into your life? Why do you yeah. have these conversations? Why? It's all from Allah. So, you know, yeah. I think sometimes when people are worried about their future, I'm saying Allah's going to look after you. Don't worry. And if it's a, <clears throat> a difficult stage in your life, Allah will look after you. Don't worry. It's all written. It's all there for you to do. So yeah. I'm never fearful of anything because what's written is written. I just need to be the strongest, the best I can be for like whatever my life will be. Well, wow, 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 that's um, that's that's, that's very inspirational. I think um, and very interesting at the same time. <laughs> um, so let's let's talk about um, actually making art, right? If mm -hmm. you, I know that a lot of uh, people that make geometric patterns, they look at what's been what's been done in the past in terms of architecture and what have you. Um, but if you wanted to just draw something, right? Um, and I'm assuming you would just want to draw something at some point, right? Um, what? How do you start? What? What? What's the basic first thing you do? So the thing is, these patterns, it's not a new art form, right? They've existed, like you said, for centuries. So one of my missions, and one thing that I really am so keen on, is to promote the existence of these patterns okay. to Muslims, to people of other faiths, to people of no faiths, so that we realize how rich our heritage is. That we have these patterns that represent beauty, that represent intellect, that represent like an understanding of something beyond, you know, like, you know, this language of mathematics is um, something that it's like the universe's language. So you'll see mm. the symmetries and mathematical properties in these patterns. You'll see them in um, under a microscope. You'll see them sure. in the, the solar system. So that's one of the things. They're beautiful in their own right. So I, in terms of making something for the first time, I look at the old things and I want to see how I can recreate them. So I have no um, creativity in terms of the geometry. I don't design new patterns. I okay. recreate. The thing is with designing new patterns, you need to understand the rules and apply the rules to design new patterns. And there are, I have friends who are geometers who do do that. And, you know, like it's a brilliant thing to do. But like for me, I see this as a, like I'm not bored of this yet. I've only been doing this say five, six years and some people have been doing it for 20 years. So I don't want to design plans now. I want to just expand my knowledge. I don't even teach or do anything that complicated because I want to, I kind of sort of say dabble in the intermediate because I want to exhaust the beginner and the simple and the intermediate so that I am fully like, you know, understand, I understand it fully before I go further. So yeah in a way designing new patterns I, I feel like it's a hierarchy so simple patterns intermediate patterns that have all existed forever and ever and ever I'm happy in that world and the next thing will be more complicated one the next thing will be designing or um, creating variations that are new um, yeah. that don't exist based on what I know but my knowledge isn't there yet so I'm happy to just recreate and uh, kind of show people that what we are recreating is amazing it feels fresh although they're really ancient Wow. not ancient wow. old <laughs> <laughs> okay um so what do you um i mean you've, you've mentioned kind of touched on it when you were answering my question my previous question yeah. you said that um a lot of people a lot of people um are interested in these patterns because they're kind of they're kind of universal in terms of the mathematics and what have you what you find in nature but what do you what else do you think drives people to this 
because I, uh, it, you find a lot of people, a lot of people willing to spend a lot of money to travel to Spain, to travel to Fez, to travel to Istanbul, to travel to wherever, to study patterns, to take a three week, a three day course. Why? What's and uh, it, I mean, if you if if you're Muslim, maybe you can say, okay, well, he wants to kind of look at Muslim history because it's part of kind of his history. But you mm-hmm. find a lot of non-Muslims interested in this. Okay, your yeah, teachers yeah. are good examples of that as well. So what do you think drives them to this? So I think, I feel like creative people are in on this open secret that we yeah. realize you, by having a creative outlet, whether it is drawing, painting, quilting, um, whether it's tile, you know, whatever creative outlet, it, it enriches your life because okay. that few hours that you spend doing that is probably some of the best hours of your day, your week, your month you start wanting to find time for this. So I feel like people who have a creative outlet, even knitting, for example, or anything that it involves us innately doing something we as humans um, do over and above other <laughs> creatures. So for example, why? what is it that humans do that is so different to the whole animal world? And one of them has to be creativity. Mm. You know, it's not a, it's not a function, you know, we don't need it to survive, yet we get so much from it. Yes. Um, you know, there's other aspects as well. Like, I always wonder why do humans need humor? Like, what is that? What is the need for that? Anyway, yeah. so in, in this modern day, a lot of our um, spare time is guided towards entertainment. So True. whether it be, you know, somebody said to me, do you watch Netflix? I'm like, no, like, yeah, I don't do stuff like that. I don't I don't consume or I don't really enjoy being entertained by a, a screen or by that sort of thing i just don't enjoy it and i think it, we as humans are we we are built to do like look at these complex hands yeah. were they built for us to just watch something no they were built for us to do so yeah. creativity is this way that you get to do and once you get a taste of it it feels like it's drawn you in and i see this time and time again so i see somebody come to my workshop for the first time the classic line they'll say is oh, I haven't used a compass since I was at school. And yeah. they say this line and I'm like, the 64 millionth person to say it. And then by the end of it, they I feel like their 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 heart is like practically exploding that they've created something so amazing, so beautiful. Wow. They just can't get enough of it. Like they've taken some sort of a uh, drug of joy. So <laughs> yeah. that process, and I wish everyone could experience it, the idea that you're sitting you take a blank piece of paper and you create something beautiful beyond your own expectations with your own hands is just um is really so worthwhile and that's what i think is one of the factors that drives us to travel to the corners of the world and spend money on all the things that are part of this and this idea that we as humans i think is a big part of us to need and want and crave a creative outlet and if you're lacking it and if you don't have it you can have a perfectly happy life, but I think my theory is you will only enhance your life by having something creative to do and something not where you're passively um, passively engaging. It has to be actively Active. engaging. Mm. It's re- I've really thought about this a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, you're a teacher, that's one. Two, you've been doing this for a while, so I think <laughs> I think um, it's probably crossed your mind at some point, right? Um, yeah, 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 it yeah. has. Uh, so that that makes sense um yeah i think i think you know, now that you've said it um if you look at if you look at little kids right um they are immediately drawn to art right um everything else might be boring or what have you but art in itself doing some kind of artistic um mm-hmm. thing is is something that every child is drawn to and we all drawn to at an early age so it's it's I think your theory makes sense. I'm kind of backing your theory up. Backing my theory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no scientist, but I, I'll, I'll back it up. I'll back it up. I think you know, children are a good guide to uh, realizing what enriches us. Like mm. you know, like um, the awe and wonder yeah. feeling you have as a child yeah. uh, from seeing somebody. You know, like oh, you're the best person in the world to a child. They they live a richer life because I think they feel more, they, they energize. So they play the way they play, um, the creative things they do, the way they engage, this, um, being so creative in another aspect, being so playful and taking risks. We just seem to like stop as adults to do these things. Yeah, 
Yeah. You've been you've been doing art for about a decade now. What's the what's the most beneficial advice you've gotten or heard from someone in terms of your practice? Ooh. Um oh, that's an interesting one. I think um it's probably a simple one, but if you want to get better at anything, you put in the hours, right? So if the first drawing you draw uh, isn't up to the standard you think it should be, that's normal because you're a beginner. So how do you improve? You practice. So I think managing your expectations of yourself mm. is really important. And um, just, re just kind of realizing that practice and practice, and if you're willing to put in the practice, you will improve. It's natural. Um, and these are kind of cliche things that people say, but they hold such truth that, you know, you learn from your mistakes. Um, and if you value the process and your outcome's beautiful, then your, you know, your process, you know, that's the, that's the bonus. The process is the actual thing that is the gift uh, and the most valuable thing. So if you value the process, however rubbish the outcome, it will make your next piece better because it's part of the practice that you're building. And you learn more from the things going wrong because you find tactics to fix them mm. so i don't know these are kind of the kind of um things that people generally say a lot and i really kind of take them on board and then repeat them but i don't know who and what would have said it the first time because it feels like those are general sort of advices that you then live and breathe and you think yes there is such value in mm. practice there's such value in making mistakes there's such value in um enjoying the process so i think they just those regular things but i kind of really latch onto them i think um being a teacher as well you kind of you kind of own that as well because you whenever you want to teach something you you have to be that much better at it and so i think it also pushes you as well to to discover your mistakes and discover things you can get better at and to you know to thrive on But also saying that, you know, there's, an, there's a joke that people say to teachers, teach. <laughs> so there's this funny little saying that people said to me, I think it's like a way of teasing teachers. So I think there's, there's this uh, concept that you know, the teacher should know everything or the teacher should be the expert. I don't believe that, actually, because mm. when I taught maths, when I taught A-level students who are 16 to 18, I could see they were little mini geniuses sitting before me and all i had to do was kind of give them like the doorway a seed into the thing and they would be already solving things better than me quicker than me mm. um, more efficiently than me correcting me so all of these things they're really brilliant at and what i, I used to have this big folder of all the answers with some gaps in yeah. and then they would sort of they're like can you fill in the gap because you did it better you know so like there's this idea what a teacher should be and i think it's actually in reality if you let go of the idea that a teacher should know so much um actually they don't and you learn so much from teaching and you learn so much from your students so mm. i i kind of would tweak that idea that uh, I mean, the reason why I might practice a lot is so I can deliver something to a good standard. Yeah. But I don't think it's uh, the final, complete, perfect product mm. either. Okay, I'll take that. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so uh, before we wrap up here, are there is there any are there any projects, special projects you wanna you wanna you wanna tell people about? Any exhibitions? Maybe I know Corona is out there right now, but um anything you want to let people know of um so i'm teaching um with uh, my friend esra who's islamic illumination and um, we're doing this course where we're kind of basically revisiting our trip to uzbekistan and yeah. we're kind of spacing out through the year because i was like i like i like planning things so yeah. it's going to be in feb and it's going to be in april and then in so that's one of the things i'm doing and it took me a little bit of a while to kind of do the live teaching because I just didn't feel um, well practiced. So that's one of the things that I'm doing in terms of other things I'm doing things that aren't necessarily available to the general public, maybe so I'm doing um, a speech or a plenary a conference um, at the ATM, which is the Association of Teachers of Maths in 
March yeah no April actually um so that's one thing I'm really excited about I've never really done like a talk to adults and it's kind of going to be exciting so I shall prepare my little socks off for that but I don't know how open it is to people and okay. apart from that the things I've been thinking about and also I think you know the one thing I love is I love having um time and space to think of ideas and to kind of you know let myself breathe in terms yeah. of what I want to do next so I don't really go yep I'm do that and then dash off I like to have a slower pace of life because teaching and banking were well, neither of them were slow so the existence I have is slow so my next ideas I'm kind of mulling over for what I want to produce yeah. in terms of uh, things for YouTube and things for my Patreon which is um, kind of a membership thing but yeah I'm just at that mulling over stage and there's no rush in my mind to kind of uh, get things sorted or done <laughs> nice 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 um miss samia thank you very much for joining us today it's been very entertaining as well as <laughs> um educating and um i think a lot of people are going to appreciate what you've said okay oh, thank you for having me and thank you for asking and um i really like a uh, I, I was such a harsh person. So when people contact me, if I don't like the cut of their jeep, <laughs> I can be really good at ignoring things because I'm like, and then, you know, like, so um, you were patient with me when I said, I'm not in the mood in December. And then you were patient in kind of getting back to me now when I'm in a much better kind of happier place. And also I really appreciate that, you know, your questions were really interesting to me. It's so funny. I get some boring questions and I just think, oh, who can be bothered? <laughs> so the fact that you took the time to research it is really useful um, for me. And also I think what managed to get out of me and I think it's a good job. So um, thank you, I appreciate it hugely. All right, thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll definitely catch up with you in the future. <laughs>